Hi everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for watching my talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about joint work with Tony Carberry on a point line incidence problem that is motivated by the Kakeya conjecture, uh, which in turn, of course, is motivated by the restriction problem, which, uh, as we know, says let's take a curved surface in Rn and let's take a function defined on that surface. What does its Fourier transform look like? What we know is that if we take an little cap of the surface and we take the function only on that cap, then the Fourier transform of that bit is uh, evolving like a sum of waves, each supported in a different cube, and all those cubes point in the direction normal to the cap. So if we take another cap uh, that has another normal and it gives rise to a family of parallel cubes pointing in that direction, uh, in which the Fourier transform of that little bit, the blue bit, evolves. And we see that because of the curvature, uh, the waves coming from different caps interfere with each other when the corresponding cubes intersect. And the problem says, the conjecture says, that in principle, this wave interference should be destructive whenever waves meet. So that for a very wide range of exponents, uh, the p-norm of the Fourier transform is controlled by the p-norm of the original function, despite the fact that the Fourier transform is supported in a higher dimensional space. Now, this is a very hard problem. And since we can't show that, in principle, we have destructive interference, maybe we could show that if we have constructive interference, that cannot happen very often. And that leads us to the Kakeya conjecture which says, let's take a family of cubes congruent to each other, pointing to different directions. Uh, then can we show that these cubes rarely meet? In other words, if we take any point here, can we show that in principle, very few cubes will pass through it? In other words, for every point, we look at the number of cubes in our family through that point. And we want to show that in principle, this behaves as a constant. So if we raise it to a large power, we expect it should behave like the same quantity to the number one. The, this is not expected for every x, but on average. And the largest power for which it is expected to be true is n over n minus one, where n is the ambient dimension. Uh, here, clearly, the right-hand side is smaller than the left-hand side. However, we expect that the left-hand side is smaller than the right uh, up to a log loss that depends on delta and on constants depending on the dimension. Now, the right-hand side is very explicit. It is the sum of the sizes of the cubes. And since all cubes have the same size, it is the number of cubes times the size of each. Now, again, this is a very difficult thing to prove. Um, and therefore, we were wondering if we can remove not only the waves, not only the oscillation, but also the volume. So instead, we take a bunch of lines and we try to show that they rarely meet under conditions. Uh, so the analog uh, that we created, the analog question that we created is the following. Let's take a set of lines in Rn no restriction on their directions. And let's take, okay, not all points in Rn, but all at least two-fold intersections. Uh, if we add over all such points, the number of lines through the point to the same power as before, uh, does the quantity we get, is the quantity we get quite small? Is it controlled by this? And this upper bound, is actually uh, smaller in general than the upper bound in the Kakeya conjecture. Now, clearly the answer is no here. This cannot hold in general because for example, the lines could cluster on a plane like this, uh, in which case the twofold intersections are uh, as many as the pairs of lines, any two lines can meet. So the left-hand side is at least L squared. Uh, which is considerably bigger than the right-hand side when the dimension is at least three. So we need to impose some higher dimensionality in this problem. And for that reason, instead of looking generally at 
at twofold intersections of lines, we look at points where the lines meeting their span are in. And those points are called joints. So a joint formed by a family of lines is a point where the lines meeting there span the ambient space. Um, and we still ask the same question, uh, but instead adding over joints now only, joints formed by our family. Uh, is it true that if I add over all joints, this multiplicity, and the number of lines through the joint to this specific power, the like Kakeya power, do I get this upper bound? Um, I expect this should be true with a constant loss, not even a log loss here. And we prove that this is true in three dimensions, and we give some information on quasi-extremal configurations of lines. Uh, before we go on, just a, a very brief history of the problem. In the left list, I have the people who worked on simply counting joints, uh, simply showing that the number of joints is at most this, without uh, counting a multiplicity, attaching a multiplicity to each joint. On the right list, I have people who worked on counting joints with multiplicities, but uh, all these works were motivated by another conjecture by Tony Carberry, which um, has a slightly weaker multiplicity here, has a smaller left-hand side, and that one actually holds in all field settings. That is what Zhang proved. However, the inequality we propose here uh, dramatically fails in finite fields, so it could only hold in Euclidean space. And in sp specifically for R3, where we prove it, we actually use Euclidean tools. So this is our theorem. Our inequality, uh, the powers in our inequality be can become three halves in three dimensions. And we promise some quasi-extremal information. So let's think of a very simple situation where the left and right hand sides are almost equal. That's the case where all the lines pass through the same point, making it a joint. Then we only have one joint and the multiplicity of that joint is the number of lines through it all the lines to the three halves. So left and right hand side are the same in that case. And you see that the only condition here should be that the lines form a joint at the point where they meet. Uh, other than that, we, there shouldn't be any condition imposed on where they point, for example. So we should be a bit careful when we look for structure in the set of lines that would form a quasi-extremal configuration. Uh, we'll actually be focusing on joints with few lines through each, unlike this example. So uh, we'll be looking at joints, each with at most this many lines through it, uh, square root of uh, the number of all lines we have. This uh, threshold comes from the Samaradi Trotter theorem, as we'll see. And this set of joints with few lines through each. Uh, can be split in two sets, a good and a bad set, where the good set satisfies an exceptionally good estimate compared to the one we're aiming for, in that the exponent on the left is almost two, much higher than three halves. The bad set doesn't satisfy such a good inequality, and it is responsible for the three halves exponent here, uh, but actually has structure in space that we call nearly planar. We'll explain what that means, but uh, roughly speaking, it means that our lines mostly cluster on planes. And in fact, for every one of our joints, most of the lines forming it lie on the same plane. Um, I'd just like to say that it's, this is a bit reminiscent of um, what we know for the maximal Kakeya conjecture in R3. So uh, Wolf showed uh, with his hairbrush argument that we have a Kakeya estimate under the assumption that tubes don't cluster on planes. And this is along similar uh, lines that um, whatever, however bad this inequality may be, uh, it is because of the existence of uh, sets with planar structure, the existence of lines clustering on planes in our picture. If uh, such sets of lines didn't exist in our picture, then we would have a much better inequality. Right. Um, 
So let's describe what planar structure means. Let's take a family of lines and the set of points living on those lines. We said that these points have planar structure if the picture looks a bit like this. So in particular, we can partition our points into planes such that some very nice things hold. See here, I assign the blue points to the blue plane. I assign the red points to the red plane. And what happens here in planar structure is that um, I can pretend that the incidences for the blue points come only from lines of the blue plane. Uh, in particular, let's look at the, this blue point right here. Uh, we have in our original family lines in the blue plane through it and also lines outside the blue plane through it. But we can ignore when counting incidences the ones outside the blue plane. More precisely, uh, I draw um, blue the lines that live in the blue plane and contain blue points. I draw red the lines that live in the red plane and contain red points. Uh, what happens for these sets of lines is that if I focus my attention on any single blue point, then the number of uh, lines in my original family thread are as many in terms of order of magnitude as the number of blue lines through it. For every single blue point, this will be the case. And similarly, for every single red point, the number, the number of lines in the original family through it uh, is comparable to the number of red lines through it only. This means that when I count incidences in my whole family, it suffices to count incidences within each plane, involving lines only from within that plane. And the other property is that the red lines and the blue lines have nothing to do with each other, so they form disjoint sets of lines. Practically, what does this mean? Let's take a line that could be simultaneously blue and red. So this line would have to be in the blue plane and in the red plane. So it would have to be their intersection. And here, this intersection, I drew it blue because it contains blue points, as you see. What property two says is that this line can't be red at the same time. So it cannot contain red points. Uh, in other words, as you look at this blue line, which lives on the blue plane, you will see blue points along it. That's why the line is blue. And you will see a fan of blue lines coming out of each blue point along the line. And all these fans of lines will live on the blue plane. You will see no fans of lines emanating from the um, red line from the blue line, I'm sorry, uh, living on the red plane. So fans of blue lines in the blue plane will come out, but no fans of red lines on the red plane will come out. In other words, this configuration is forbidden. So you cannot have uh, a line that's purple like that being shared by blue points and blue fans in one plane and red points and red fans on the other plane. Either this picture will be holding uh, or this picture, but not simultaneously. Right, so let's see some ideas in the proof. Uh, let's take our, a set of lines and the set of joints that they form. First, we'll fix our attention with, on joints with a fixed number of lines through each. So let's call uh, JK the set of joints with about K lines through each where k is the dyadic number. Then our inequality, our goal inequality becomes a bit easier. Uh, we want to take every joint in jk, uh, look at the number of lines through it, that's about k, and raise that to the three halves and add over all dyadic k and get the upper bound. We said we're gonna use Euclidean tools. One of them will be the Samaritan Rotter theorem, uh, which says that for every k, um, we can control JK according to how big K is. So we have these two bounds, this if K is at most uh, square root of L, and this if K is at least square root of L. And that is where our threshold comes in the theorem, the square root of L. 
between structure and non-structure. Uh, you'll see that this second case um, trivially gives the inequality we want. So if we focus on joints with a lot of lines through each, more than L to the half, then we can take this left-hand side and replace JK with this upper bound, L over K, and get exactly uh, what we want. So uh, we will focus on the first case of, of joints with few lines through each. The second tool we'll use is the polynomial partitioning by Guth and Katz. And the main idea is you start with any fixed K uh, that is small. And if you have an exceptionally good estimate for your joints in JK, then you call that K good. And that is boring, it is uninteresting because the joints corresponding to good case will satisfy this exceptionally good estimate we were talking about. If uh, this extremely good inequality with power almost two on the left doesn't hold for this K, then we say that this K is bad and we're looking for structure for JK. And even better, we're looking for structure for the union of the bad JKs. Um, we will work with first with each JK individually, each bad JK, and then we will unite them. Uh, so I should say that to show that each single JK has planar structure, we're not really using new ideas. Um, these are sort of things that have been done before. But the hard part is to unite the bad JKs and show that you still have structure. Uh, actually, we won't show that the union has planar structure. We'll show it has nearly planar, meaning that um, maybe the union doesn't have planar structure, but we can pick out for every k a large subset of the corresponding jk such that the union of those has planar structure. So in terms of order of magnitude, when counting incidences, we're not losing anything. Right, so we fix our attention to some any bad JK, uh, each point in there looks like this. It has about K lines through it. And we partition JK using the zero set of a polynomial of interesting degree. And that degree comes from the Samaradi Trotter theorem. We have a quantity that is non-trivially larger than one, and we can use it as uh, the degree of some polynomial. And using such a degree, we partition. We chop up our JK in about uh, in a specific number of cells, and each cell contains at most its fair share of joints. We have, as usual, two cases here: the cellular case, where many of our joints live inside the cells, and the algebra case, where most of our joints live in the red bit, which is the zero set. Uh, we show that the cellular case cannot actually happen, so. This is sort of standard. We show that the degree that we picked is just large enough to give enough complexity to the variety so that it engulfs most of our points. The other case, the algebra case, is the one we are really at. So the picture, sorry, looks like this. Everything red is in the zero set here. Uh, our points are red. We can pretend they're all red. They live in the zero set. Now our points populate our lines. Uh, so in principle, uh, that will infect the lines too. The lines will also be in the zero set. Uh, so it can completely ignore actually when it comes to counting incidences, the lines that are not in the zero set. Everything is red for me. Now remember our goal was to show that we have planar structure somehow. What we'll do for each, for this bad JK and any bad JK, is that we'll show that in principle, the joints and the lines forming them cluster on the planes in that zero set, in the zero set we have here. So on these two planes in this picture, we can ignore the curved parts. And uh, to show this, we uh, look at our lines and we show that in principle, we show that each is either critical or flat. 
uh, and eventually uh, turns out we can ignore the critical lines as well as the flat lines that are in the curved parts of the zero set. We can uh, pretend that everything clusters in the plane of in the planes in that zero set. And in fact, that everything is flat. In other words, um, at our points, the ones we have kept, uh, the second fundamental form of our zero set vanishes. And also this, this is true al along almost every point of our lines, the lines that we, we, we have kept. So um, these flat joints, which are almost all the joints in the, the original JK, uh, we can see they have planar structure. Um, it's sort of obvious in some sense because um, in this picture, as I've drawn it, um, we can see that the line that contributes in one plane cannot contribute to any other. Let's think of this. A line that could contribute to both these planes is their line of intersection. But this line here of intersection is a corner along this zero set. Both these planes live in the zero set. So along this line, I cannot have any tangent space and therefore I cannot have any flat points at all. So my flat points don't live, they live elsewhere. They don't live in this purple line I've drawn. In other words, the fact that this line here uh, is not even flat means it cannot be one of those I'm looking at. So it doesn't contribute to either plane. The lines in one plane therefore have nothing to do with the lines on any other plane. Now the hard part is to um, unite the situation coming fr from the analysis for different bad K. So for a single bad K, we have uh, after our analysis that the picture reduces to this, flat joints on flat lines on these planes of that zero set. Similarly, for any other bad K prime, we get another polynomial that gives another blue zero set, let's say, uh, where everything clusters and is flat for that zero set. Uh, the fact that each uh, of the two pictures uh, has planar structure doesn't mean that their union does as well. So imagine a situation where the two pictures are like this. In the top left here, I have a line that is, uh, you, you can see along this line, a blue fan on the blue plane and a red fan in the red plane. So fans in different uh, planes along the same line. This is forbidden in planar structure. So as drawn, this union doesn't have planar structure. So the new part of this paper, what I've said so far is not that new, uh, but the new part here is to pick out large subsets of these sets so that the union of those has planar structure. Overall bad K, of course, not just two of them. And here is uh, how we do that. We want to show that this picture doesn't repeat itself very often. So here, this comes from the analysis for some K. This comes uh, for the from the analysis for some K prime. Um, we want to show that this picture doesn't happen often. So in other words, um, we have very few red points on such a line or very few blue points on such a, such a shared line. I'm thinking of this as very few blue, red guests, very few red guests on a blue hotel, this plane, or uh, very few blue guests on a red hotel, okay? Blue and red points like this cannot share a common line in the middle. That's what I want to show. And uh, even though the two zero sets, the red and the blue one, come from the analysis for two different Ks, um, they're actually related because the red plane cannot be blue, cannot be in the blue zero set. It's only in the red one. Why is this? Uh, suppose it was blue, then here we would have this picture. Uh, the blue zero set would contain two blue planes like this that meet on the middle line I have drawn. Now the middle line then would have been uh, a corner of that zero set. So there would be no flat point along it. But here you see, I have flat points. These two flat points are the blue ones along this blue line, the middle line. 
So it's impossible for the red plane to be in the blue zero set. Similarly, the blue plane can't be red. Right, and let's say, say that this picture happens often. In other words, uh, it's common for many red points to share lines like this with blue points. If there are many red guests in, in total, then one of these lines here will contain uh, more than the average. So let's say that this line contains more than its fair share of red guests. Uh, each red guest has k lines emanating out of it, k red lines. So we have a lot of red lines in this picture. And we split in two cases, one where uh, more than half of these red lines are also blue, are also in the blue zero set, not just the red one. And the other where more than half of our lines, the red lines are simply in the red zero set, not in the blue one. Now the interesting case will be the left one, let's focus on it. The other case will also give a contradiction, um, will give the same formula to give a contradiction. So let's assume that more than half of our red lines are also blue. Here they are, I've drawn them blue. Now uh, in the red plane, in the red zero set, I have a lot of blue lines. So the blue polynomial vanishes along many lines on the red plane. And this property, this vanishing property uh, would infect the whole red plane and make it blue if the blue lines were more than the degree of the blue polynomial. If the blue polynomial vanishes on more than its degree lines, then it would have to infect the whole red plane and vanish along it. That's impossible. So the blue lines in my picture here are fewer than the degree of the blue polynomial, than the degree of the blue zero set. Now this degree depends on k prime, not on k. Remember it came from some Meredith Rother as stage k prime. Uh, and I would like to really get a contradiction, right? I want to show that it can't have too many uh, guests, too many red guests or blue lines like this. Um, but if I rearrange here, I don't get a contradiction because I have no uh, idea what k and k prime are, what is the relationship between j k and j k prime. If I could replace this denominator here by the one for k, uh, in other words, if this inequality held, then I would be happy because if I rearrange now, uh, left and right hand sides in this uh, line, I would get that my gens are good, are extremely good. You'd see it get an estimate with an exponent um, equal to two on the left, much larger than three halves, which is impossible here. I, I chose bad k, not good k. So I would have a contradiction if I had this inequality for my denominators, for my k and k prime. And of course, I cannot be sure that such an inequality holds. However, one of the two quantities will be smaller than the other. So if this one is smallest, great. I get a contradiction to having a lot of red guests here. If uh, the other quantity is smaller instead, then I run the same idea, but on the other side, on the blue side, and I show that I have very few blue guests like this. Uh, so we make an algorithm, we create an algorithm where whenever we work for a single k, we look at k primes that uh, give a bigger product here. And that's really the idea behind the proof. Uh, just one word. So see, we had the good joints that satisfy exceptionally good estimates. We forget about them. Then we have the bad joints. We show somehow that altogether they have nearly planar structure. Uh, how do we prove our KK estimate now? Uh, remember in planar structure, uh, the idea is that the incidences involving points living on one plane, we can pretend come from lines only on that plane. So we split in planes like this in our planar structure. We work counting incidences in every plane independently. We sort of prove an improved some Reddit rotor theorem in every plane. And then we add up overall planes, and there is no double counting of lines. 
because in planar structure, uh, a line only contributes to one plane and not in any other. So that is the way we prove the Kakea type inequality in the end. Thank you very much for listening.